uh, Melissa McCracken, I've introduced Bethany. So we're each going to speak for about five to seven minutes, and we're going to go in order. I'm going to start. I'm, I sort of do the broadest kind of research in this area. Then we're going to turn to Bethany, and then we're going to turn to Melissa, um, and because we're going some broad to more narrow issue areas, but all are equally important. And as I said, we're only going to talk for about five to seven minutes. Then we're going to open it up for question and answer session. We'll take a series of questions uh, and hopefully have a big conversation in this room. When you ask your question, introduce yourself. We'd love to know who's in the room with us, um, who you are, what's your affiliation with the Fletcher School, um, and, and also end your statement with a question mark. We really do want questions. <laughs> um, so in terms of training, so we're going to each respond to four issue areas, right? So first, we're going to each talk about our training, our discipline, and our focus, why we're researching this, uh, which I think we all agree is why you're in this room here and listening online is, is that it's extraordinarily important. Um, so why we're researching this, but in, in particular for each of us, what are the key takeaways from our field of study? We're each involved right now in, in this uh, field. And then where do we think our fields need to go in order for us to make progress in this important area? So in terms of training and discipline for me, I always trained as an international relations scholar in security studies. Uh, anybody who's in that field, some of you might be the Fletcherites. Um, I was trained by John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt. So real sort of state centric kind of issues. Uh, and really, if you, you're, if you understand what the realist tradition is, it's about state and state interests and this idea of global governance, sorry, Melissa, <laughs> is hogwash because states are going to do what they want to do, right? And so my field, when it thinks about climate and climate change, two issues, one is it's a global issue. We know that, although individual states and regions are responsible. Um, and second is, is that the issue focus tends to be about war and violence. Think about Russia and Ukraine. There's another panel on that, right? Um, and the idea of studying climate First of all, it, it's not necessarily state centric because it transcends boundaries. Uh, and second, it's very slow moving. You don't have you know, a, an army crossing the border, right? You don't have the threat of th thermonuclear war between states. So for a very long time, and I think it continues to today, most scholars didn't study it in the social sciences and in particular in political science and international relations. Um, uh, so, so it's been an issue and I've started the research and I, when I started the research, I just did sort of a sweep of the literature in my field across the top 15 journals. And there was only a handful of articles on this topic, handful. It's really disgraceful because of course, uh, this topic is really important. And as an anecdote, when I was in graduate school at the University of Chicago, my husband is also an international relations scholar guess what he studies? He was also trained by, by you know, scholars there who are in violence, right? He, his dissertation was how the weak win wars, right? But he had written a proposal on climate. He thought, wow, this is gonna be a big issue. So this was 25 years ago. And he was basically told by his supervisors, you're never gonna get a job. It's too interdisciplinary. It's not focused enough you know, on state-centric issues, right? It's not war, violence, political conflict. Um, and we wouldn't know what to do with you, how to get you a job. Right. So he dropped that topic, which is a shame because he could be a leader now, 25 years later, he teaches at Brown in this area. And I suspect his story is not alone. I suspect when I was going to graduate school in the 1990s, a number of students were told losing proposition. You need to stay within your, your lane within political science. You need to focus on a topic that's of interest to fellow scholars. Climate is not one of them. There were a couple of outliers, Tad Homer Dixon at the University of Toronto. Um, and, and the fact that I can say his name, that this one person, right, coming out, um, uh, very few people were studying it. Part of the reason is, is that the academy um, uh, rewards people within their lanes. When you come up for tenure, you come up for tenure within your discipline. And the study of uh, climate and climate change requires interdisciplinarity. Um, now, I was, came to this in a, in a peculiar way, uh, which is, is I also study religion and violence, and I joined a team of scholars, um, and, and what's really interesting about religious actors is they have long time horizons. Policymakers don't. Think about, you know, Russian President Vladimir Putin. He expected to be in and out of Kharkiv in three days and on his way to Kiev, right? Uh, American politicians were in a, um, uh, an election year, and they're all focused on the fall. Right. Whereas climate is this sort of long standing, I call it an X factor because it intersects and it takes a really long time for us to sort of see uh, some of the worst effects of it. But if you look at religious actors, 
they have time horizons. Another anecdote, at one point I was researching religion and global politics, and I happened to meet the Pope's foreign minister. Yes, they have a foreign ministry, it's a state, right? And he was negotiating with the um, um, leader of Belarus. And Belarus, as you know, is one of the most autocratic states uh, with Russia, the Russian Federation and North Korea. And if somebody said, how can you negotiate with this state? You know, it, it's denying the rights, the basic rights to its citizens. It doesn't allow public assembly, blah, blah, blah. And he says, you have to understand from the Catholic Church's perspective, they're making progress. Over hundreds of years, they have a lot more freedoms and liberties than they did. And that was really insightful to me. I thought, wow. So I started writing about time horizons and thinking, what happens if you have different actors in the international scene with different time horizons? And so I hooked up with a group of scholars who study religion and religious actors. And we looked at mutually escalating violence. We did a lot of work in India between the Hindus and the Muslims. There's a lot of rioting um, and communal conflict there. And then started reading a little bit more and realized that there's this whole sort of idea around dominion over the earth, right? Or dominion of the earth that a, a number of Christian evangelicals in, the, in particular in this country were writing about. And so I said to my team, I said, what if we look at climate, right? What if we, we look at religious communities and we look at religious theories about religion? And there's a particular theory, if you took my class, uh, you would know called terror management theory, which is as humans, unfortunately, we know we're gonna die. A lot of species, we don't know it all, but most species probably are not aware that they're gonna die someday. So humans have adapted to deal with that. And climate change is one of those issues in which humans now uh, are having to realize that it's not just us as individuals, but humanity. But anyway, so I've been doing a lot of work on that. Um, and what really compelled me, so if we could put the first slide up, was as I said, I'm a scholar of political violence. I saw this map. And I was prepping my class on civil wars, actually. And again, I'm trained as a political science and political violence. And I was struck by this because what this is showing you is that more people are displaced by natural disasters. Now, some of those natural disasters are not climate driven, right? But climate exasperates it. Um, but I thought, wow, I'm in this business. I've always been at schools of public policy to inform policy and try to make the world a better place, right? To end human suffering or alleviate it in some way. And I thought I need to shift gears a little bit. I need to look at climate. And so now I teach a course on it and I'm, and I'm part of research projects looking at that. So the key takeaways from the field are limited research on the topic still, even today, it's growing. Um, the social sciences, just so you know, if anybody, the name of our panel, is climate change and conflict. And I actually had a reaction to that because I thought, one, it's not true. Actually, if you look at the literature, if you look at the main finding, you actually get cooperation more often than not. You do get political conflict, right? And you do get conflict and social conflict, but there is no direct linkage there. Um, so if, if you take nothing away from today, that's it. That's good news. Um, and then, question. yeah. What do you consider a disaster? That would be an earthquake. So that would not be a climate induced, although these two are more expert. We, some people think that the tectonic plates shifting are actually some, it's some Anthropocene, some human uh, related to that. So natural disaster, but it could be flooding as well. Uh, so Bangladesh is a big one. Everybody studies Bangladesh, right? Mm -hmm. um, so natural disasters can be both climate induced or non. Climate induced might be the intensification of hurricanes, um, um, and then the non-climate related would be an earthquake. And I think in this um, graph, we see more of sudden onset disasters instead of slow onset like drought. So it's much more like tropical storms. And so we can sit single yeah. events. Yeah. yeah, so make that, we, we can more readily, we think, again, we're still working in the empirics, make the argument that that's probably intensified because of climate uh, changes happening. Um, so, uh, where do we need to go from here? Uh, we, needed, we need multidisciplinary teams, which is a big ask because of course the academy has to change um, and uh, because people need to do career advancement. And one of the beautiful things about the Fletcher School is we're interdisciplinary. So we're able to do the kind of work that we're doing here. So great for the Fletcher School. Uh, and also we, we reward people for that. We actually do that during their tenure. Uh, we need funding, right? Much more money needs to be dedicated to this topic. And the problem is, you know, with policymakers and, and funders, they want the immediate. They don't want these longer term sort of um, issues investigated. 
And then lastly, very importantly, we need to be able to effectively communicate our results. This is an extraordinarily complex issue with lots of modeling in order to get climate systems and understand them. But then we need effective communication, right, about what our results are actually saying. And unfortunately, I think a number of academics don't appreciate that. They're talking to their belly buttons or to their neighbor's belly button, thinking they're having a wonderful conversation. And actually, no, we need to project out what our main findings are. And by the way, the policy implications related to that. So we do have a lot of work to go. There's a little bit of you know, uh, optimism here, um, but, uh, but the good news is climate and conflict, there's not a direct link. The bad news is we still don't fully understand the full links and the conditions under which you, under which you get cooperation. But Melissa will address a little bit of that. Um, and then Bethany is gonna talk to us about basically the slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I can go next. Just a little bit of background. I did my mall at Fletcher, and I graduated in 2020. I studied climate policy and gender analysis, and now I'm doing my PhD on climate migration policy in the U.S. And climate migration is the avenue through which I came to this topic of climate and security and climate and conflict. And a little bit about how I initially started becoming interested in climate migration because there's a lot of similarities between the way that people talk about climate and conflict and the way that people talk about climate migration. I was living in Guatemala before I came to Fletcher and I was working on a permaculture farm and I worked with farmers who had actually moved because of drought. They said that they had previously had their own farms and then the drought conditions in Guatemala made it so that their farms were no longer productive and they had to move to these other areas, work on other people's farms often just to be able to send money back to their families. So that was what initially got me interested in this topic and what made me want to do a PhD and study the policies behind climate migration, particularly as the US does really influence what's happening in Central and South America. And that is where a lot of media is talking about these waves of climate migrants coming to the US border. And what we actually see is a much more nuanced relationship between climate change and migration. So rather than, I actually think this is a really interesting map because it does show maybe people answered a survey and they said, this is the main reason why we moved. So there was this sudden hurricane and they left, but the graph doesn't actually capture the nuance of what might be happening in the background. So people maybe left and then returned to where they had lived previously. Maybe they already were experiencing a lot of economic difficulties and then the disaster hit and then that was the final straw that pushed them to leave. So the relationship between climate and migration is extremely complex and that makes it very difficult to design policies to effectively respond to it. And I think we see something similar with climate and conflict. There's a lot of alarmist literature. I think, so Homer Dixon is a really interesting example. He was an important early scholar on the topic, but at the time that he was writing in the 1990s, there wasn't a lot of empirical research on this relationship between climate change and conflict. There was a natural assumption that as environmental degradation worsened, as populations, as population growth increased exponentially, that there would just naturally be more competition over resources. And as a result, more conflict that resulted from this competition. But in the years since that, since those early publications in the 1980s and 1990s, there have been a number of empirical studies, I think largely within the climate space and less so within the security and international relations space, as Monica mentioned. And they have shown that there is this, there's not a neat causal link between climate and conflict. And we've seen Syria, the civil war in Syria as a very commonly cited example of a climate conflict. But actually people who have studied it, studied it more deeply have found that it's the climate might be an exacerbating factor. The drought may have made the, the war happen earlier or have allowed it to be intensified. But in reality, there's not just, you can't say that it's just a climate conflict. And so really capturing this nuance in both the academic liter literature, but also in the media is really important. And that is part of what motivates my research is seeing 
particularly with climate migration, whether the policies that are being designed now under the Biden administration, whether they actually are reflective of this nuance, because it's not just a, a black and white, here's a drought, this person moved because of the drought. So the answer is to adapt to the drought conditions. And my field is, I, I kind of situate myself within climate policy. Um, and so thinking about this policy space, often a natural response is these kind of technocratic adaptation measures. So drought resistant seeds or making people less vulnerable to climate change. But when we see this complex relationship, so in Syria, there were a lot of governance challenges and inequality and poverty that worsened the condition for Syrian citizens. And so that led to a combination of different factors that eventually led to the civil war. So when we're thinking about climate adaptation, it doesn't just mean how do we make people less vulnerable to a drought? It means a much broader conversation about institutions and governance and really just engaging with these complex topics in policy spaces and finding ways to actually capture these really multi-causal relationships and understand them more deeply. Um, and I think similarly to Monica, I think where the field needs to go is a much deeper engagement across different fields, particularly when thinking about governments. A lot of my research prior to my current research looked at climate finance and it's so difficult to decide where to place the climate finance. Is it within the Ministry of Environment? Is it within an NGO? All of these different actors that are important in the climate space. So particularly when thinking about something like climate and conflict or climate and security or climate and migration really needing within government ministries this deep understanding of these complex multi-causal relationships. All right, is that working? <laughs> cool. Um, so thank you both for the great kind of filtering down into the, the more narrow uh, aspect of water. So I wanna start with a question for you all. How many of you used water today? I hope every single one of you <laughs> raised your hand. If you're not, you, you did, you just didn't know it. Um, so ultimately, why is water important? Well, we can't talk about climate without talking about water. So you talk, heard the examples that Professor Toff gave and that Bethany gave. And many of those examples relate to water, whether it's the droughts, whether it's the flooding, water is inherent within climate change. And so to be able to think about climate and conflict, we really have to start talking more about water. And I think this gets to the point that Professor Toff was making with respect to the siloed nature of academia and the, the difficulty that we have without thinking about these questions from an interdisciplinary manner. And so that's kind of where I come from in this kind of space. So. My background is actually in engineering. I did geological engineering, didn't really like it, wasn't for me. Um, went off, did a master's degree. And so I think this really highlights in my personal experience, the importance of doing a master's degree, just like we do here at Fletcher. And it changed my whole career direction and my whole life direction. And I took a class on water and I realized how important water was to our inherent daily lives and also these bigger questions with respect to state interaction and all the way down to the individual scale. It's, it's a ubiquitous thing that we utilize at, at any time and place. So um, that led me to get a degree in geography. So geography is really about the study of the interactions with space and scale. So how does the earth and humanity interact? So nature and environment, human and, and earth interactions. So it's a really great sector to start asking questions about water, conflict, and cooperation, which is where my, my research interests lie. And so I always have to preface because I'm, I'm personally biased and I have little blinders on that when I talk about water, I'm talking about fresh water. <laughs> There's a whole other sphere. And I think this shows the exact bias um, of these siloed natures is that we haven't really started this intersection of looking at fresh water and salt water together. And there's starting to be a conversation of this source to see and thinking about framing our water questions in that way. Um, but it's, it's still pretty new research in the last probably five years. So 
In terms of like how I came to this topic and why in particular I think this is important, many of you probably have seen the recent news articles coming out about the Colorado and the mega drought. You might have seen, you know, the bodies they've uncovered as the lake has lowered as well. Um, it's an unusual factor of climate change. We can solve some unsolved murders. Um, but ultimately, the decline of Lake Mead and the mega drought within uh, the United States is an international question. The Colorado River Basin is shared between seven states within the U.S. It's shared between numerous Native American tribes and reservations, those recognized and those that are not. And it's an international basin. It's shared with Mexico. And we have different groups of actors. And so you create this complex network of actors and users of the Colorado River Basin, those that might be in the basin boundaries themselves, and those like Los Angeles and San Diego and the Imperial Valley of California and those agricultural sectors that utilize the water in the basin, but aren't actually in the true topographic boundaries of that watershed. So we have this complex network of actors that interact and have to share this ever declining resource. This creates a need for cooperation and a potential for tension or for conflict. So what we do at the international scale then is we try and track where is conflict and cooperation occurring. So this is a map from a popular science article, which is based on data that I work with and a, a data set that we're actually in the process of updating. And essentially what we're doing is we're trying to track and monitor where is conflict and cooperation occurring. So as a geographer, I have some issues with this map. <laughs> um, you will notice that the colors are red and they get darker in red. This is a poor design choice on, on behalf of the cartographer. This is the number of events that have happened. They can be both conflictive or cooperative events. So just by looking at this event, and this gets to the point that Bethany was making about how we communicate this to the broader public, is we're seeing this map. And if you just glanced at this map, you're like, wow, there's a lot of conflict happening. But that's not the case. In reality, those, those uh, circular diagrams, those are the number of conflictive events that are happening. The red is just showing you the number of total events that are happening. So we can see there are hot spots where we have more negative events happening over time in particular basins. And we can see that in many of these cases, there might be a lot of events happening and they're not actually conflictive. We also know there's a bias with, in terms of the data set that we utilize for this, right? So it's media-based bias. You're going to see more news articles about negative events than we often see about cooperative events. Those are just going to become more prominent in the news cycle. And so our data will also reflect that inherent bias. So these are things that we have to think about as we're communicating about climate and conflict and about water and conflict. So in terms of the big takeaways that I, I want you to takeaway from what I'm talking about and with the field of water and conflict is there has not been a war over water. The last documented war over water was 5,000 years ago between Lagash and Uma as in Mesopotamia. We have not had a war over water since. And I would say as a scholar on this, it were very unlikely to see a true war strictly over conflict over water in the future. It does not mean water is not a casualty of war. It does not mean that water is not a tool of war, but it is probably not going to be the sole and only cause of a conflict. States are much more likely to cooperate over water. This does not mean there's not tension. It does not mean there's not violent conflict, particularly at the individual scale. We often see more conflict happening at smaller scales than we do at the state to state level. But I think this also presents like a really good opportunity to think about how do we cooperate and the positive nature of kind of the future for climate change. So ultimately what we found looking at this type of data is that the institutional capacity is what's important. Do we have the treaties in place? Do we have the institutions in place? Do we have the adequate diplomatic relations in place? Those are what's going to provide the resilience for states to have better cooperative processes in the future. Where I think we need to go, and I think what's going to happen as climate change continues to exacerbate tensions over shared waters at all scales, not just at the state to state scale, 
is that we're not going to necessarily see more conflict per se, but we're going to see more unsustainable use and more inequality in that use. And that's where we need to start focusing our cooperative efforts. How do we develop cooperative processes to support sustainable use in the long term? And that's equitable for different users of water. Because as you saw, all of you are users of water. It's something we can't escape. So how do we make those systems to address inequality going forward? Um, and I will leave it at that for questions. So we have enough time. Um, just right, pass it. Just pass it. <laughs> um, so that's great. Thanks um, for those. Just for both of you, and then we'll open it up. I mean, where should we be concerned? So in terms of migration and then Melissa, where should we, you know, in terms of water, you talked about, you know, the Colorado River Basin, which as Americans, we should, for the Americans in the room, but where else in the world? And then where should we be optimistic? Where have you, you know, when you've done research, you thought, wow, that was a really clever way for them to resolve that crisis. Um, and I will say, you know, following up on both of you, what we have found in the international relations, international security literature, when there is a connection, the number one factor is poor governance, right? And, 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 and related to that is not good public policy, right? In dealing with crises um, over resources. And so the good news is that we're at the Fletcher School. There's lots of schools of public policy that are teaching, trying to teach how to have better governance. Uh, and the question is, is whether we can make an impact there. So I think we, or I think in each of our research, we find that poor governance is often a driver. And then the climate issues, resource issues, uh, event issues sort of drive and just show how hollow or how inept a state is. And then the inequality, right? Where you have distribution, distributional issues across the society um, happening that. So, so for both of you, I mean, where should we be concerned and, and where can we have a little bit of optimism about how some of these issues are being resolved? Sure. So I think that in terms of vulnerability, specific countries that are particularly of concern, um, we see a lot. There's the, the Notre Dame Global Adaptation Initiative Index, and they look at the, the, the world's most climate vulnerable countries and they do a ranking. And we see a lot in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think particularly it's, I don't know if it's a climate and conflict concern or a climate and security concern, but I think it's just a, a global issue of concern that we see a lot of countries that are highly vulnerable to climate change that are also experiencing conflict or they're considered fragile states according to the World Bank fragile states list. And so for me, what one area of research that I'm particularly interested in is studying why there is this kind of connection between countries that are climate vulnerable and countries that are in states of fragility or conflict. And also how do we actually enable these states to adapt to climate change? And there's a huge lack of funding that's going to climate funding that's going to these states because it's very hard to deploy funding in climate or in, in conflict affected situations. And so that's, I would say, a big area of concern in terms of climate security. And for um, the class that I TA'd with Monica this semester, we looked at the National Intelligence Council's um, strategy on climate and security. And they really highlighted this area as well as Central America as areas of concern. And mostly because these areas have a combination of institutional and governance challenges as well as particular vulnerability to climate change. And in terms of where is there space for hope, I would say as of yet, I have not seen much on the climate migration front, a, spe a specific example that is particularly positive, but I'm hoping to see more of that in my research because I'm sure <laughs> it exists. But I think also I, it's positive that the framing of climate migration is becoming less militarized and less securitized. It's now being talked about more as an adaptation strategy. So people have moved because of climate or because of environmental factors throughout human history. People often moved because of changes in weather patterns or volcanic eruptions. We've seen that for thousands of years. So it's not necessarily inherently a bad thing or an unusual thing for that to happen. So framing it as something that could be positive if people do want to move as an adaptation response, 
It doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing. And so that language shift is definitely happening, but I would also say still needing a lot more exploration of the nuance and understanding because there is forced migration that is happening because of climate change and preventing that from happening, but looking at it as more of a complex relationship. And I, you definitely do see that in the academic literature and increasingly in the policy literature. So that's hopeful. Mm -hmm. That's a good, good hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So in terms of water, um, I think for places where we're looking, and, and this is more uh, focused in terms of my particular research is looking at state-to-state -state interactions. When we're looking at tracking for potential for conflict or potential for cooperation, we're, we've uh, kind of the current framework for looking at what we call hydropolitical tensions. Um, essentially, we're trying to track the level of institutional capacity that's available in, this, in that basin. So whether there's a treaty present, does that treaty have a mechanism for allocation between the states? Do they have a, a mechanism for conflict resolution or dispute resolution embedded in with that, that document? Do they have some sort of variability mechanism? So do they have some sort of way to track or respond to a particular drought or a flood or both ideally, and then whether or not there's an institution in place. So we call them river basin organizations. And so essentially what we do is we look for the presence of these within particular states, and then we can uh, use a proxy indicator for the construction of a dam. And generally what the research has shown is that in terms of water, the trigger has to be more um, abrupt and for there to be conflict. Slow droughts generally don't trigger higher levels of conflict. And so we'll use the construction of infrastructure like a dam or some sort of large diversion project uh, or a rapid political change. So a failed state or maybe a state unification, something like that, that might trigger some sort of political change and that will lead towards conflict. So those are kind of, you know, if you wanna take a look at the globe and look at some of those areas, those are ideally where, where you're really gonna see more potential for conflict. Um, in these states. So the Nile obviously is a, a common example that is being really prominent in the news. Um, right now, there are stamps being constructed on the upstream of the Mekong River Basin, but there are a lot of institutions in place across the Mekong. So we might see that there is some resilience and built in adaptation to be able to deal with that, for example. Um, in terms of places that are working really well, actually, I would like to cite the Colorado River Basin or kind of the broader US Mexico. Um, interaction, the, the institutional design between US and Mexico is really unique. We have what's called a minute system for the Boundary Waters Treaty um, that's signed between US and Mexico in 1944. And essentially, it gives the basin organization the ability to add on to that treaty with a formal minute process. And they're up to 300 or something now. And it creates a really flexible adaptation mechanism for the basins that are covered by the Boundary Waters Treaty or by the treaty, that, so the Rio Grande, the Colorado and the, uh, the Tijuana rivers. And so that particular setup, I think is a really good example for a positive situation. Um, some of the big basins in Europe, uh, the Danube, the Rhine, where we see a really strong river basin organization as well. Uh, Southern African basins also have pretty strong river basin organizations. And so we can see um, some really good examples where they're building the institutional capacity. Mm -hmm. So why don't we open up for questions? We'll take a couple at a time and then we'll have the panelists respond. So I saw your hand first. Can you introduce yourself? Canyon Fletcher 2015, and I work in ch um, child welfare and child rights. And I, my primary concern has to do with um, systemic racism and the African American population. I'm hoping that you can speak to climate and how it affects um, not only the African American um, population, but minorities in the US and how that translates into um, an international issue, uh, especially as it pertains to um, populations that face financial challenges. Great question. Um, gentleman here. Sorry, I'm gonna go back and forth. I'm gonna make you earn your steps. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks, Thierry Books from uh, uh, class of uh, 91, 
a long time ago already. Um, uh, thanks a lot for the great introductions. I had, you know, a, a couple of questions because I think it's it's fair to say that there are so many different dimensions to the way climate and conflicts are intertwined. Uh, by out of curiosity, uh, are you defining conflict as um, military conflict between two states? What about social conflicts? In, uh, I mean, within a particular country, because one of the things that we see increasingly is the, the quest for resources, including water, which is driving urban uh, density, which is driving migration, I mean, uh, rural urban migration towards cities. And basically, this is becoming a huge issue precisely in terms of climate adaptation. Uh, and, and, and this could trigger you know, some form of uh, questioning to the economic model, and this is already happening, the, the, the questioning of the economic model we, uh, we currently live in, which, you know, uh, over the medium term could, you know, foster military conflict as well. So everything is, is kind of intertwined. My a second question had to do with a scenario analysis, because when, if you, when you look at the situation of the war in the Ukraine, this is absolutely fascinating to see the ripple effects and which, you know, can uh, can move in different directions, because what happens in the Ukraine is, is the sort of perfect storm be, beyond the military conflict and the tragedy it constitutes on food prices, on energy prices, on inflation, uh, which is affected, affecting global supply chains. It's but it could also be an interesting opportunity in terms of the fight against climate change, because for the first time, I mean, investing in renewable energy is a good business proposition because of the way oil prices are behaving this uh, this these days. And my question is, within the framework of your research, are you also doing some scenario analysis, looking at what could happen if some conditions uh, were to uh, to be present uh, on this issue of uh, of climate and conflicts? Great question. Uh, we'll take two more. So this gentleman on the left, I'm going to make you run. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, this is a question uh, primarily for. Uh, Who, are Who are you? I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Luke Nye and uh, um, Fletcher 97. I also, uh, 2001, I finished the PhD. And so this is a question going back to the migration issue. And so, you know, you mentioned that migration is caused by acute events, flooding, hurricanes, these sorts of things, uh, which, you know, are linked to climate change as extreme weather events. But then adaptation to increase the resilience of the communities that are impacted by these events is slow to, to, to incorporate. I mean, resilience building takes time. So how do you, I mean, what kinds of policies or practice or things can be done to bridge that gap between these, these disparate timelines in terms of the solutions are slow to implement, um, but the, immediate, the need is immediate. Thank you. Great question. All right, we'll take one more. I'm gonna go here. We'll come to you in the next round. Thank you, uh, Richard Ponzio, also Fletcher 97. You might have saw us leading the dance, dancing last night. <laughs> um, I lead a global governance research program at the Stimson Center in Washington, DC like many at Fletcher, interested in international law, global institutions. The Security Council has been engaging conflict security debate, has a friends group. There's been difficulties in just getting a resolution passed. I'm wondering if you're tracking that, and if not, the Security Council, at least the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the COPs, how are they looking at these issues? Okay, that's great. And what's really beautiful about these sets of questions, we did not plan this, we did not plant the audience, um, is I think the first one is best for Melissa about the inequality and dealing with that. Uh, I'll respond to yours. It's Terry, is that right? Um, and then uh, Bethany, if you could talk about Luke's question about migration, and then we'll go back to you, uh, Melissa, on um, global governance issues. So Melissa, you're going to get two of them. <laughs> So to talk a little bit about your question with respect to racial inequalities within both the US scale and the international scale, I mean, absolutely, we're seeing impacts of climate effects and having you know, environmental justice issues within the US. Um, there's a, a great book that uh, came out last year, the year before um, by Catherine Flowers looking at wastewater treatment inequality um, in Alabama. 
And she writes about essentially looking at how we have kind of legacy of racial laws in the past that have led to a decline in wastewater system access to these communities that are predominantly African-American and the way that the law has structured to continue to punish those people for lack of access rather than providing support and getting people access to water, wastewater sanitation. And so it's one of the few countries or few places in the U.S. where we still have uh, hookworm, I believe. I might be slightly off on the exact micro, but I believe it's hookworm. Um, where most of the rest of the world, or rest of the U.S. Is, has um, removed that as, a, as an issue in those particular communities. And so I think that's where financing in particular for the U.S. Is, needs to be targeted. And we need to have particularly targeted financing to provide better access to these small communities, to communities of color, and to really think about how do we create policies to allow for better access to clean water, to better access to sanitation. When we get to the international scale, I mean, I think the, um, not to use the trickle down economics, but I think when you start seeing inequalities with state to state levels of sharing, it's just going to exacerbate inequalities within that particular country. So if the state in a different power structure might have less access to water or to reduced quality of water, say if they're a downstream state, um, that's coming from the upstream state, that is going to impact the communities in that country. And you're going to see the same difference with it with respect to power in those communities. And so the communities with less power are going to receive less access, going to receive poorer quality water than the, communi the communities that are more powerful or more rich. And so you can see the kind of the multi-scalar impact of state to state interactions with cooperation and how that can then translate to increased inequalities at more of the community scale. And so the community scale isn't my particular focus. So I, I apologize, I can't answer this question as in depth as I would like, uh, but I think that's why in terms of the research that I do, looking at the state to state cooperation and focusing on inequity between states, and how that translates to inequity within the state is particularly important. And so and if I could just jump in on that quickly. So for my, for my comps, which I just finished, um, for the, my second field is gender and intersectional analysis. And I wanted to really look at intersectional environmental justice and intersectionality, I feel like can be kind of a buzzword, but really like there's a deep scholarly root of intersectional research in black feminist scholarship and that has now started to come into environmental justice research and people are really now talking about especially in the past few years how to make global climate policy much more meaningfully intersectional because all of the research on environmental justice does show that minorities are far and away way more vulnerable to climate change, both within the US and around the world. And so one of the most, I think, tangible things that I read about in this field was the importance of data that is actually disaggregated across race, ability, economic status, and all of these different factors that are, and gender, and um, all of these different factors that often aren't included in traditional UN data sets. Um, so really having that and having that depth of analysis so that we can understand these dynamics better in order to design actually meaningful policies that incorporate this systemic racism that manifests in climate vulnerability. So thanks. And just following up on that. So one of the, I think, and Rachel Liu is in the class, she took my class this term on climate and security. And I think the most interesting set of readings, Bethany, you can correct me because you were helping with, with that, <laughs> was on the colonial legacy, actually, and then corporations when they go into local communities and how the local communities actually, by the time they realize there's an issue, it's too late. The corporations have so much money, legal help and all of that. Um, and, uh, and so we actually do now and are seeing 
drawing on prior literatures to try to understand these issues. Um, and we haven't talked about corporations in the private sector, which are implicated in this, right? It's not just governments, uh, but they have money and they have huge legal teams. And often at the local community level, people are at a loss, right? Uh, as to what to do until it's too late. Their water, their springs have been tapped or whatever it might be. Um, Thierry, on your, your question about conflict, you know, um, how are you defining conflict? Uh, so I'm a political scientist. So generally speaking, I am looking at political conflict. All politics is conflictual. We know this from James Madison, right? Uh, for me, I'm really curious about violence, right? I, I want to understand the conditions under which people are willing to fight and die. Uh, and what I say in my writings is more importantly, allow their children actually to be put in harm's way. Uh, so I'm a student of nationalism, religion, ideas, what motivates people to do something beyond themselves. Um, but in the field, uh, people are looking at violence across the whole gambit, both from structural violence, right, which we could talk about water, people talk about that as structural violence, it's slow, right, or people use the term slow violence, right, because it's actually physically harming people over the longer term, but again, because it's, people aren't dying on the street and blood spurting out of them, we tend not to see it, but it's still very damaging, uh, not only physically, but to the psyche. Um, and then there are a lot of people who study communal conflict. And in, it, when it comes to this climate stuff, it, you're gonna see it at the local level. And actually more often than not, it, it, it may be the locals against corporations because the government's made a deal and said, yes, you can come in um, and create a sewage plant or you can have this resource or do a deep mine and need water resources for that. Um, and then as to scenario analysis, um, well, it's interesting, the NIC does do scenario analysis and, and the National Intelligence Council put out a report, it's the first time the American National Intelligence Council put out a report on climate change, right? And actually it started under the Trump administration. So the US government is recognizing this, thank God. Um, and then the Biden administration accelerated and said, we really need to understand National Intelligence Council, give me a report. I re we really need to understand uh, the vulnerabilities, not only to the United States, but to the global community. And that, so, so you are starting to see them doing the second, third, fourth order effects. And you're, I think you're absolutely right. Should we say if there's any good news coming out of Ukraine? Um, it is that we are seeing how interconnected we are as a world. And once this war is resolved, let's hope sooner rather than later, although I, I study this war very intensely, I'm not so sure, we can have a whole conversation about that, um, that we can now focus on sort of the bigger challenge. And I was thinking while we were going through this, I wasn't struck that more people at that panel than this panel, but I think what we're discussing here is gonna be more consequential. Um, so you guys made the right decision. Um, <laughs> but uh, well, anyway, so, so you are seeing scenario analysis and I think Ukraine is helping with that. I mean. This morning, very distressing report that the United States is going to help Ukraine take out the Russian military uh, Navy, the, the Black Sea Fleet, because we can't get grain out and we're worried about the Middle East, right? Not being able, Egypt in particular, right? Not being able to feed its population. And then there's real advances in methodology in the social sciences and in engineering and computational sciences, where we're doing these things called agent based modeling, where we can actually we set up fake worlds of humans, right? And you use a lot of experts about how a human would respond to a particular so Terry, if we do something to you, chances are 99% of the time you're going to respond in a particular way. And then we do something else. And so you can do this thousands of simulations. And so you're seeing that kind of work being done uh, in order to model human societies to see whether you're gonna get the cooperative outcome. And we found that in our research on religious communities or the conflictual outcome, which you do get sometimes. So, so there is some advances in the social sciences on that. And, and, and again, working with computational scientists. Um, Bethany, do you wanna to turn to Luke's question about the migration issue? Absolutely. So yeah, I think it's a, an incredibly important question and one that is very difficult to answer. And I think a lot of people are asking it right now because as we've all mentioned, these, these issues are, are not neat. And so, and then also there's the time scale. So exactly what you said that resilience building happens over a very long time scale. And then these, many of these events are very sudden or also they are combined with other events that just make it not really feasible for people to stay where they're currently living. And I think some of what Melissa talked about with there are certain indicators that you can see that have these positive impacts on cooperation. I think that we need a lot more measurement of 
adaptation interventions and what that means for different things. So what that means for out migration, what that means for socioeconomic status, not simply just people are more resilient, but really looking into what that greater resilience means over time. And what I've heard from both people in the government who work on adaptation, as well as scholars of adaptation, is that there is a really big lack of actual data and studies that show that impact of adaptation measures. So that's an area for, I think, really rich future research. And Professor Erin Coughlin de Perez, who she's at the Feinstein Center, she was one of the IPCC authors of the adaptation report that came out recently. And she scoured the literature on adaptation for years. And she was, she said she was very surprised to find that there is this limited amount of data and scholarship on what actually really works and what works over time. So I just think we need a lot more of that so that we can understand these kind of conflicting timescales and then design interventions and policies that actually capture that kind of misalignment in timing. Yeah, so to kind of talk about the global governance question, um, so with respect to water, I mean, we have several global institutions. So the, there's two framework conventions that are now open for ascension for water. Um, there's a 1997 UN Water Courses Convention, and then there's a 1992, which we call the UNEC Convention, but it was recently opened uh, to global ascension in 2015. And so we do have some global governance instruments in the UNFCCC process um, for the climate change and you know, for the more broader climate change. The challenge, I think, uh, states, have, with particular with water, states have been really apathetic to signing on to those agreements. The 97 convention only entered into force uh, when the 35th state joined, and that was only like three years ago, and it was signed in 1997. Um, and there's still only 35 states that it, or 36 states now that apply to it. The UNEC, the UN uh, ECE convention has more states signed to it because it started as a regional agreement, and they're now starting to get more. Um, non-ECE states to join the convention, but we're still seeing a really slow uh, uptake of states joining on to these global water governance instruments, which I think is particularly challenging. I think the big piece is that states are challenged to see water as the state resource and wanting to protect and preserve their sovereignty and use of access, and then recognizing that they're also transboundary resources. And so they're reluctant to sign on to these global conventions to give up a, even that perceived sense of sovereignty, even though almost all of the states that are not signatory still utilize many of the key principles that are within those conventions. So we're seeing states adopting the, the core ideas within these conventions, even though they're not actually signing on to them in practice, which I think is still a positive direction. And so we can see the influence of these global institutions, um, even if we're not actually seeing states come forth and just outright sign on to them. So there's still a lot of positive work looking at the global level. I think the challenge really is with enforcement, just as it is with any other global governance inst instrument. All right, so we'll take one more question and then we have to wrap it up. So we'll take the gentleman in the back. Thank you very much. My name is Andreas. I graduated last year and uh, I work in peace building now. And also in peace building, there's now a field that looks a sort of curiosity about this climate and conflict link. And it's a bit now a race between organizations also to be positioned and have a profile on this. And I think this is when we often like skip the step of like taking into account the complexity and the nuance that's needed. And at the same time, I was also pushed by donors to simply design programs that are climate and conflict sensitive and so on. So very concretely, I think everybody agrees that it needs to be multidisciplinary and integrated approaches. But in practice, it's very different languages. If you, I mean, and now recently I started speaking to a climate scientist and for work and it's like, it's not the same language. And it's also very hard to uh, translate this long-term science in things that have, have to happen in a project span of two years. So very concretely, what, what are, the, so to say, the, the recommendations on uh, between, like, like, how, like nobody knows how to do it. Like we all talk about it and we all want to have a profile on it, but nobody actually knows how to do it. So 
Any ideas? <laughs> All right, thanks. It's a great question. I have an answer, but I'll come up the line and that will be your closing words. Okay. I'll quickly just say in some of the research that I was doing on looking at some of these concrete examples of how to even just have conflict informed climate action or climate policy or climate projects in a, in a country that is experiencing conflict. Um, Mercy Corps was the one organization that I was able to find that really tried to capture the complexity of the relationship between climate and conflict in some of their programming. I think, I think some of it was in East Africa, but I can't remember the exact country. And so I think just at the project level, there are things that are happening and they probably are considered still pilots, but worth looking at how there are a few organizations that are really trying to do this within their climate adaptation work. Okay, thank you. Fabulous yeah. 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 Well, school. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an excellent segue into my thoughts on this question, especially in the water language or in the water sector, the question of not speaking the same language. And generally what we see is we have the policy people, we have the science people, and there's that bridge is not really there. Um, so I walk a weird line because I have a technical background and then I switch to policy. And so that's something I think that education plays a big role. So in my water classes here, I really am trying to get students to be able to understand the science so they can start having the conversations. And so I think that's the role where a school like the Fletcher School plays in a key place. How do we train students moving forward to start being those bridges to be able to talk with the, the scientists related, whether it's water, whether it's climate, and be able to bring that into the policy so we're making better informed decisions. So mine's sort of a follow-on, which is, you know, the Fletcher School, first of all, we are really strong in international security. We're really strong in um, um, uh, conflict resolution and negotiation and in the environment. And so if there's, and now we are developing much more so our technical side, right? We, we think about our cyber program, but then also hiring people who have um, um, technology backgrounds and innovation. So what I do is encourage people to come to the Fletcher School and get training here because honestly, it's gonna be schools of public policy that are gonna sort of have the most impact I think in these issue areas because it's in those schools where people are talking to one another across disciplines um, and then just continue to support people in this area. Um, you know, say you're doing a good job because it is slow moving, just like this, the crisis is slow moving, doing this research is slow moving, but we are getting, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic that we are getting some traction, but the question is, is it going to be enough in time? I mean, that's, we're up against time now, which is all the IPCC reports coming out and we're, we are in a crisis. It is a crisis. So thank you, everybody. Uh, a great audience. Uh, enjoy the rest of your time here at the Fletcher School, and we'll see you around the building. Perfect timing. Yeah. yeah. I don't know.